The new game that we're doing, of course, yeah. is uh, Shroud of the Avatar mm -hmm. Forsaken Virtues. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, this makes it clear to people what my intention is, that I'm really trying to go back to uh, my roots. You know, it's been 15 years since I've worked on a fantasy role-playing game. It might be sort of almost 15 years since you've worked on a medieval yeah. fantasy role-playing game. Yeah. Since we sort of departed about the same time. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, it's time to go back and pick up the mantle of, uh, of what we had done uh, before and uh, uh, and carry it forward, even though it won't be with, uh, quote, the avatar, uh, of the, the avatar of virtue uh, from before. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, but I think it'll you know really you know when I when I describe the game to people, I say look I want to tell a story driven basically solo player experience, mm -hmm. akin to Ultimus four five six or seven, a world interactability which is similar to uh, the Ultimus seven I think is the best target for, and the uh, wonderful open uh, non combat roles and persistent virtual world of Ultima Online which obviously you're intimately. Familiar yes. with. Uh, and so that's what I'm hoping to demonstrate to people here. So, and what's interesting, we found already in our Kickstarter, we sort of have two camps. Yeah. We have absolutely the camp of people who want to go back and play a story driven solo player game and never want to see another person. Right, right. And we have a second complete camp who's going, like, no, I really want UO like it was when you guys made it. Um, and so, and here's, and this is all prototype art, you know, this is uh, not the finished art by any robot stretch, but it's kind of a proof of concept to, for people. So, can I ask a question? Absolutely, of course. Before we even get it, like, yeah, on the title screen. So, Forsaken Virtue. So, who has Forsaken the Virtues? Is it the player uh, or is it the world? Uh, the, well, uh, uh, or is some, I, mean, some, I know some, the answer to that question. I'm trying to think of. Uh, uh, or has that not been revealed? No, it hasn't been revealed to players, but since you asked, I'm trying to think of, I think that's uh, something I'm willing to uh, disclose. Uh, I think it's reasonable to disclose, which is, it's not you. We're not making any, mm -hmm. we're not saying you have forsaken anything. Uh -huh. You return to the world which has, to, to a world which has, uh, uh, which has kind of gone beyond uh, or moved away from the virtues as you remember them. Okay. Whatever that game was have been that you would remember them from. Sure. Got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and Shroud of the Avatar is also selected to say, um, you, you know, the, uh, as you know with the term avatar, you know, which has now become the generic term mm -hmm. for any player character's projection, um, you know, we're trying to also say that the, sh this, the, the shroud of the avatar is, uh, you know, in that, um, uh, you know, whether it is you, whether it's a previous character, whatever it might be, you know, shroud can be a, you know, a, a robe of concealment mm -hmm. or, or the death robes of something. Okay. And so that also is uh, you know a bit of a double entendre about uh, or the mantle for the mantle you take of, up the mantle of exactly. exactly so that's that's the, that's right. the general Got it. and uh, and you can see that by the way I'm uh, you can see there's a kind of a fog of war that goes away as I explore the world right. here uh, this is there's sort of a this is the outdoor map <clears throat> and I have sort of a Paul Bunyan esque giant you know character that is uh, walking around. Uh, outdoors here uh, to begin with. Whenever I go uh, to, for example, these little villages, I can then choose to, you know, enter that village, and uh, then it pops into a more uh, third-person, over-the-shoulder uh, camera. Uh, you know, I can run around through the village. I can, you know, go over here and interact with uh, various objects. I can even come over classically, you know, like you could in my. Or, oh, yeah. Oops! 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 Hang on. What happened? There's a bug, Richard. There was a bug. Wow, I found a bug. <laughs> it's, uh, I haven't ever seen that bug before. I've seen it before. But oh, there it is. It is still there. But yeah, there's a piano in there somewhere. Uh, but you can actually play the piano usually. <laughs> uh, you can come outside uh, here and uh, here in this town. There's an empty lot. And I can go over here to a little for sale sign. I can uh, you know select uh, that I might want to build a shop or something here. Uh, so I could start a business, you know, blacksmith or whatever else. Um, and would you say empty out lots as more players started playing to <coughs> make room for them? Uh, for excellent them? question. So you remember in UO, one of the interesting side effects of open housing was that we suddenly ended up with a world full of empty houses, yeah. abandoned houses and abandoned ships, mm -hmm. and then we had to write a co fairly complex play to go clean it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have in this, in this game, there are uh, villages, mm -hmm. towns, and cities. Villages have very little uh, game-created infrastructure, like a bank or right. uh, you know, a, a guild hall or a, a auction house. 
uh, but have plenty of room for a little farming in you know, communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the cheap place to own a house on a small lot. Okay. But if you go to a town, there's a little more infrastructure. This is a town, by the way. So here you can see this little castle in the center. You'll have uh, you know uh, more thing, more things that would attract traffic flow. Okay. And, and the city, and this city happens to be set up like a, a tic-tac-toe board. There's two north-south streets, two east-west streets, and so the center square is all public services. The outer square is all ten bigger lots than the villages, but only ten. So there's only about a hundred. Uh, you know, where there might be 150 village homes in a village, mm -hmm. there's only a hundred. Uh, or maybe less than 90, I think, actually, this number uh, in a nominal town. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a city, not only does it have much more infrastructure, but in general it has protection. We have these, uh, we've, been, we've allowed a little bit of mechanical technology, the, the, the mechanical age has come in, and we have electrical capability, Tesla towers that kind of provide, provide these uh, protective fields. Mm -hmm. But there's only a dozen or two houses around it, but they're really big. They're big enough for like a guild hall, or they're big enough for. You know, uh, since people, be, there absolutely will be a bank there, and so you know, you know, people will be coming in and out to do commerce. So if you want to be the best blacksmith in the land, you know, that's the place. Like, in, used to be intrinsic. You know, right. there was always the the ten thousand dollar piece of property was the blacksmith uh, okay. place right there. Right. Um, you know, uh, we have to have gates that take you around the, the world, and in this case, uh, we've come up with the fiction of lunar rifts, which uh, are based on the phase of the moon. So if you come over here to this lunar rift, you can see there's a camera. Uh, that is showing the other side of the rift, and because the, we have a full moon up here, you can see there's a uh, charge that comes from the pillar uh, of the full moon into the lunar rift. And so, either I have to wait till a new face of the moon to go to a new town. Each one of those has a, a town that it would take you to, or in some of the really advanced towns, they've built this like bird cage trellis over this entire site, and there's a crank you can turn on the side of it that has a mirror that reflects the moonlight down onto another pillar. Mm. And so they can manually override, uh, you know, the uh, the gates themselves uh, to uh, uh, to control. So any, any player can walk and go. Oh no, I don't want to go to that town. You know, it's the way every time you want. Okay. And uh, and of course, uh, if you're playing online, uh, you will. You know, these are you know static encounters or towns. Uh, the little moving gypsy wagons are, are moving encounters. Mm -hmm. uh, the gypsy wagons, as an example, are some that when you encounter them, it could spawn up one of a variety of encounters. It could be the friendly gypsies, who are here to tell you about yourself, the, the, the desperate gypsies who are under siege and you have to go save them, the evil gypsies that when you get close to them will actually attack you, uh, so they have some variety in the encounter that might pop up. Uh, and of course, uh, just like in the older Ultimas, you know, you might need some swamp boots to run through the swamps here without getting poisoned. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, All right. that. well, I expect I most of you recognize Starlong, also occasionally known as Lord Blackthorn, uh, the producer director of Ultima Online, uh, as well as all around great guy. So thank you, by the way, for coming. You're welcome. Hello, internets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and of course, I have to start with something uh, here myself. You know. Uh, 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 you know, it, it, was, it, was very, it was very sad to me that, uh, you know, this was right about the time I left the company yeah. that you guys got these things going, and so Lord Blackthorn got one of these totally badass, uh, you know, character models, and Lord British was already gone, so I, that's why I didn't get, uh, I didn't get one. Uh, and even this one I had to go buy on eBay or something to actually track it down. Oh, wow. So, uh, at least that's my memory. Who knows uh, where I actually really came across it. But okay. if I could get you to sign it uh, here, please, that would yes. be... Uh, very kind of you, sir. And start sign both Star and Lord Black okay. just for good fun. Okay, I will sign Lord British Rocks. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you're, you. Thank you are most welcome. So as, as a hardcore collector myself, uh, you know I even have a bunch of my uh, couple trophy cases full of collectibles up in the uh, hallway. So thank you very much for adding to my uh, collecting case. My pleasure. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, you've just heard me go to go through you know my spiel of trying to go go back to the golden era of role playing games, plus try to add a new veneer of how to handle uh, multiplayer in a way, mm -hmm. or you know everything from solo all the way up through persistent multiplayer. Uh, and hopefully a fresh way that is uh, uh, you know going to 
harken back to those early days and yet provide uh, you know, something that might be a new model for uh, for role-playing games. So, uh, first, what do you think? Did you like what you saw? Uh, very excited. Uh, for two things. One, uh, I think one of the things that I'm most interested in in what you guys are doing is that level of simulation that you got that you know you pioneered with Ultima Four and beyond of like all these things do stuff, you know, where it had like sort of peaked at Ultima 7, and it's like you can bake the bread, and you can collect flour, and, but, and then you can use that to poison Lord British, you know, I mean, like, that, that was, and... <laughs> but the, don't. Yeah, that having that level of simulation underneath the whole thing, I think, is exciting because you get all these uh, unintended outcomes of mm -hmm. it. Uh, I think also what's interesting to me, and I find very uh, poignant, is that when we, when we were having the original discussions about Ultima Online, when we were calling it Multima, mm -hmm. we... The first thing we talked about was adventuring as a party with your friends. It wasn't about you know thousands or millions of people together. It was right. like because you could have a party in Ultima of all your companions, but they were AI, right? And, right. and we what we fantasized about in those original discussions was like, well, instead of companions, what if those were your friends? And I, I so I think that's a very compelling thing that we, we never actually did. Right. And so. You know, 15 years later, we're actually delivering it. You're going to deliver <laughs> what that initial discussion of Multima, which yeah. became Ultima Online. Yeah, oh, and I think I've touched a little bit on, uh, you know, when I've just been talking, uh, you know, online and some of the chats we've done and things about the difficulty of getting approval to make Ultima Online. And so I would, I, I, I would love to, I don't, I don't want to adulterate you with, uh, with my version of those happenings, but. What would, what would you describe was the journey of the first time we decided to seriously pitch it mm -hmm. to the day that it shipped? What would you just give us your, <laughs> you're in a nutshell of Do we have the like difficult, four days? Yeah. Uh, but what would you say were the, the, the milestones of success and failure of getting permission and the team together and uh, uh, getting belief behind the project? Well, I mean, there was that original discussion we had, which is like, hey, wouldn't it be fun to do Ultima with your friends? Right. And that really came right about the time where we all started playing Doom in the office, and we were all kind of like, wow, other humans are way more interesting than, you know, at the time, any AI we could generate. We were like, and, and it was also the time of the beginning of the internet. So that's right, just, yeah. Uh, at, that, at that point, there I don't know if the web even, or had just mm -hmm. come into being at that point, uh, and uh, 4800 baud modem was the, <laughs> the state of the art. Uh, and then when, and fast forward to when we shipped, they had just released the 9600 baud modem when we, when we shipped. Yeah. So those of you complaining about 3G, just remember we were working with 4800 baud. So, uh, so that was kind of just an initial discussion, and we were working on Ultima 9 at the time, and there was no budget for doing this. And so, you know, we had the conversation, and you, I think, went to Larry Probst and said, "Yeah, well, did you, did you go to those pitch meetings at EA? Did you go with me on those?" No, that's what that was. Oh, so I need you to fill me on the other side. Yeah, I need yeah. to fill in this. So we didn't go to pitch it just once. We were turned down the first time. Right. We were turned down the second time, and it was only on the third time that we got approval to, with with the great reticence, to go over budget by about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I don't even. It wasn't even that much. I thought we got like a hundred thousand. Might have been a hundred. But it, it was. It might have been a hundred. But it, it was some some relatively small amount of money right. to make a game. And so yeah, and that's when we were like, okay, well, let's build a prototype. And we were like, well, we don't know how to. We don't like we've never and, built. And and what and and what was the team like? How did you put the team together? And what was your office space like? Oh, great question. So uh, we didn't. So we we you know everyone else had work. Like they had already been allocated to all the projects. So I had to build a team from scratch. And so the only thing and there wasn't there wasn't like there were any massively multiplayer games out there. I mean, there was like Air Warrior and like Neverwinter Nights, but. They weren't operating at the kind of scale we thought we were like, well, what do we do? So we hired a couple of mud guys. So we, uh, Rick Delschman was our first hire, he was a programmer. And we asked him, hey, you know that thing you were doing with muds where it was text, can you do that with graphics? And so he was like, sure, I just need some graphics. So we gave him Ultima 5. And in the space of a few weeks, he built this prototype where we could run around. Um, there was no chat or anything like that. Uh, the only action you could take is if an object was on the ground, you could run over and it would be in your inventory. And if someone ran into you, it would fall on the ground. So it basically, it was yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. soccer of sorts. Yeah, so everyone, like who's going to hold it last would be the winner. And uh, we got the whole company to play, and we all got on comp like speakerphone, uh, confer a big giant conference of the company. And we were like, oh my god, this is amazing. We should do this. We should do more of this. Let's get some more. So then we got four more people. 
Um, but again, then we didn't have any office space. So they were rebuilding the fifth floor. Oh, yes. And so, and when I say rebuilding, we're talking about taking it down to these studs, including removing the outer curtain wall. Right. So there was no wall to the outside except in one, like these two offices right off the elevator. So when you exited the elevator, if you took a right or a left, you would fall into the fourth floor. Right. Or into space. Right. So you had to go straight into our offices. Uh, and it was also uh, the winter. Mm -hmm. So the, whenever you would open the door to our office, it would open out into the cold. Texas winter, uh, which, you know, not the, not not the worst, worst but, but, but it was cold, uh, which was compounded by the fact that our servers were right underneath the thermostat. So they were generating all this heat. So the thermostat thought, oh, it's very warm in here. Like, so I don't need to run the heat. And, and I remember these beautiful plastic walls that were common to protect you from the rebuilding dust. Oh, that's right. We had like sheets of clear plastic, not walls. That as the walls. Yeah, as that the walls. was the walls yes. of the office. And we were all in one big room. Uh, we built our own website uh, that was filled with llamas because Rick is oh, obsessed by llamas. Uh, and then Raf Koster, that's when we brought him and mm -hmm. uh, his wife Kristen on board. They had been mud designers working with Rick. And we just built this team of mudders. And then uh, a few veterans uh, like Michael Priest, uh, an old school uh, artist. And then, but at that point, we realized we had to invent a whole bunch of things like authentication and registration. Mm -hmm. Registration codes, which I remember Mike McShaffrey generating the random seed for it by moving a mouse like at random to generate the number. Uh, and then we had to invent server co locations, right? Like none of this mm -hmm. stuff that EA had or Origin. Well, well, but, but, but here's another little detail. If you remember, um, <coughs> we only intended to have one world instance. Oh, right, well, because we only thought they were like three. And if you remember, the sales projections of the game were a whopping 30,000 units. Yeah. Because the largest selling online game in history had been 15,000 units, and most were 5,000 units. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what happened next? Well, so then we figured, oh, well, we need to publicly test this thing. Right. And again, we're broke. Pro we, and we didn't know, you know, we're sort of inventing as we go along, well, we didn't, hadn't budgeted for the duplication of the CDs, because remember again, we're dealing with 4,800 baud modem, so to download a CD's worth of info, which is trivial nowadays, right? Yeah. You couldn't do, so we had to actually make the CDs and then send them out. So we're like, well, we don't have any money for this, so why don't we have a sign-up page and people will pay $5 to beta test our product for us. And again, we're thinking, we'll have a few hundred people. We had 50,000 people in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. and. That's when everyone sort of woke up, like, right, exactly. uh, like EA Worldwide went, hey, maybe this internet thing is going to happen. <laughs> and it became the most important thing, and we got lots of help yeah, uh, yeah. to finish it. Uh, and then you know, we got it out the door, and it became the fastest selling PC game in Origin or Electronic Arts history. Yeah. Um, now the longest running MMO ever. And I think one of the biggest things we learned at the very beginning was that the community really owned the world more than we did. We were just kind of curating. Right. Like your famous assassination was a great oh, yeah. example of that, where it's like, oh, they have way more control <laughs> than we do. I, I remember, do you remember how like uh, the simulation for fishing, 50-50 chance you catch a fish, yeah. became super popular? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I don't remember who wrote the virtual ecology, the, you know, herbivores ate grass, yeah, yeah, carnivores yeah. ate the herbivores, and would then go to town to you know, raise an alarm to get a quest, and then yeah. players just wiped everything out. Yeah, yeah, just so it was a waste. Yeah, and it completely wiped out the whole ecological <laughs> system. Um, and what is interesting about the the players sort of owning it, having that much control, is like I, I think it's really fascinating with crowdfunding and like your Kickstarter campaign is a great example of like where now we've taken that almost to its logical extreme, where the fans now own the product from the moment of conception, exactly, not just at point of purchase, right. and, and and that. I think is a revolution. I, I think that it's gonna right. And in fact, even we try to make that clear on our <clears throat> on our Kickstarter page, where we say, "Look, we have certain kind of ideals that we feel very strongly about. You know, mm -hmm. storytelling from Ultima's one through seven, detailed virtual world like Ultima seven, uh, and uh, solo through multiplayer akin to uh, Ultima Online. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then when you get into things like PvP, when you get into things like the details of housing, uh, when you get into you know other kinds of you know, the economic models, you know, at that point you immediately go, okay, I really want to ask the players. Yeah. And uh, because we could make a decision that would really, in fact, we probably would have made, we can already tell we would have made right. some stories that really wouldn't have fulfilled their desires. And so uh, now is the time to make those changes 
on those uh, essential pieces, I think will make them, hopefully will make them happy. Yeah, and you're making, you are, I mean, what's great is you know your customer now, and you know, and you're gonna make the product that they want, right. which is for us as game creators is like the ideal scenario. It's a very exciting time. And I'm, very, I'm very excited to play it. I can't wait. Perfect, thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Star, so much. Really appreciate you coming by. And again, Star Long, the man, the legend, the person who really deserves, uh, really the you know the the lion's share of the majority uh, for conceiving Ultima Online, for building the team, for building the product. You know, I get a lot of credit as Lord British, but uh, uh, you are really the man that did work. Did well, the work. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good. See you.